This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Danny Berger and Kriti Gupta. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. Investors await news from the world's top central bankers. We're live in central Portugal as Lagarde, Powell, Ueda, and Bailey get ready to take center stage. Another dramatic shakeout. UBS is planning to cut more than half of Credit Suisse's workforce starting next month as a result of the bank's emergency takeover. And chip makers, including NVIDIA and AMD, retreat on a report that the Biden administration is considering new curbs on AI exports to China. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Kriti Gupta is in New York. And Kriti, they were the darling children of this bull market, but tech really feeling the effects of that action from the Biden administration. Yeah, they are feeling the pain, and you are seeing a lot of that effect. I want to say sentiment broadly. You're already seeing futures kind of tilt lower, central banking, of course, in focus. You mentioned the stuff we're getting out of Sintra specifically, but I really want to focus in on NASDAQ futures here because they are down five-tenths of one percent already. It's only 5 a.m. in New York, Danny, and you're already seeing that massive underperformance from the tech story. A lot of that is going to come down to a micro story, kind of a sum of all parts trade, perhaps, as we get into the opening bells. The bond market also catching a little bit of a bid here. Two-year yield at 473, we'll call it already already seeing a move of about three basis points lower. So again, the volatility is kind of getting in there. A lot of this is interesting, though. Why do you have a bid for the bond market if you were looking at a potential hawkish rhetoric coming out from Central Portugal and from these kind of central bankers around the world? How much of the geopolitics are factoring in here? I'm not even talking about Russia, but specifically these curbs uh, when it comes to China as well. What does that do to the recession on? Certainly something we're going to be exploring throughout this show. What's interesting, though, is as yields come down, the dollar moves higher. And I feel like there's a little bit of a feedback loop at the moment, Danny, because of course with risk sentiment lower, commodities are lower as well, but that takes down commodity currencies with it. So your biggest kind of tailwind for the dollar right now is currencies like the Canadian dollar, the Aussie, uh, and, and other kind of commodity exposed currencies, which again makes the dollar higher, which weighs on commodities. Like I said, a fun feedback loop. Right now, NYMEX crude trading with about a 67 handle. Yeah, European equities moving higher despite some of that risk off tone in the U.S. Maybe once we get closer to the U.S. open, that will start to undo itself. But we did just have some breaking news out of Italy. Good news, I should say. Inflation rate in the country has slowed to 6.7 percent in June. That is lower than the estimate. The estimate was for 6.8 percent, of course. That is much too high for the ECB, for central bankers that we've been hearing from from Sintra. So, yes, we still are looking at a rally across regions in European equities. We're breaking the six-day streak of losses. Uh, but just quickly want to point out what German yields are doing because off the back of that headline of the Italy figures, we're seeing a further rally in this German bond market, in the Italian bond market too. Two-year bonds are down about three basis points. Euro, though, struggling to hold on to any gains at this point despite some of the hawkish language out of the ECB, despite a report that some ECB officials are looking at more quickly unwinding their balance sheet. Okay, you'd think that is hawkish, but in the past we've seen the Hawks kind of use these things as a pawn and you get some sort of winded down, watered down version of that. Finally, just want to point out that the yield curve in the UK is its most inverted since 2000. We're at a negative 95 basis points. Uh, but pretty historically, this isn't the same harbinger for recession. It doesn't always portend one, but it just shows kind of um, what a mess the UK is at the moment, Critty. Always, always encouraging for the folks <laughs> who are who are perhaps considering a move uh, to Europe. It's interesting to keep in mm. mind, though, at the kind of center of that story is going to be the central banking piece of the equation, which brings us to one of the top stories this morning. The world's top central bankers will be speaking today at the ECB forum in Portugal after it opened with a chorus of hawkish warnings. ECB Vice President Luis Guindos says that will, while another interest rate increase next month is all but assured, the outcome of the following meeting remains unclear. He spoke exclusively to our very own Francine Lacqua earlier. September, September will depend, you know, uh, you know, what are the factors that are going to determine what happens in September will be our bank lending survey that I think that is very important because it's going to be an indication of how our monetary policy is transmitted to the to the financial system and from the financial system to the rest of the economy and how, you know, the, the tightening of financing conditions fit through uh, to the real economy. The second will be, uh, you know, our projections. In September, we will have a new round of projections. And finally, the evolution of, uh, of core inflation. So that's some of the uncertainty and debate uh, it's being talked about in Sintra. Francine Lacqua is live on the ground for us. Francine, what are policymakers dealing with here? What's the bigger risk, inflation or recession? 
Well, probably inflation, if you listen to them, Kriti, good morning. It's very clear that actually there's been a hawkish tilt, but I would suggest it's not just from ECB governing council members or indeed the vice president of the ECB. It came from the IMF deputy. It also came from Jay Powell, frankly, if you go back and listen to his testimony on June 14th. Now, the reason for this is that core inflation is sticking. Headline inflation, certainly in Europe, is coming down. But you have this core inflation, which is the one that's really difficult to get rid of, which, of course, hurts uh, the poorest the most, that could also become entrenched. So what ECB governing council members are now worried is a spiral of wage price that they're very difficult to get out of. My question, Kriti, is, and I don't 100 percent have the answer to that, is are we hearing a hawkish tilt from everyone here in Sintra, apart from Italy, but I know we'll get to that in a second. Is there a hawkish tilt because they really want to get ahead of inflation before it comes entrenched? Or is it more of a warning shot to the markets? Again, yesterday we heard come what may. The idea from Christine Lagarde that even if we have a recession, the ECB won't change track. And I wonder whether that's a warning to markets. I can't hear them say come what may without thinking of Moulin Rouge, but that's that's my own personal problem, Francine. <laughs> um, look, you teed this up really well because you mentioned Italy. <laughs> Definitely want to talk about it. The focus is on Sintra, yes, but also in Rome this morning, we learned that Maloney's government is going to be picking ECB's Panetta as the Bank of Italy governor. Now, you know Panetta well. What, what can we expect from, from this new helm at the central bank in Italy? So there are two things, Danny and Gunmarin Hugh as well, that are really, you know, in, important to understand. First of all, Fabio Panetta is a safe pair of hands. He's been on the ECB governing council member as executive director. So not governing council member, but he's been an executive director. So what this happens is that you have basically the countries, the member states uh, that sit on the governing council member. Then you have the president, the vice president, and four executive members. One of those seats is to the Italian Fabio Panetta. He now moves if approved by parliament and the like as you know central bank chief to banca d'italia he's a dove He's respected. He's been inside Banca d'Italia before going to the ECB for 20 years. So I would suggest this is a very safe choice for Giorgia Meloni. This is one of the most important appointments that she and her government have to make. The question, though, is who replaces him as executive board member? This is still a very important role within the ECB. And actually, Giorgia Meloni this morning, really, like a lot of her ministers, came out saying the ECB is doing the wrong thing. And it's unclear whether this is something that could irk the ECB or whether they understand that the prime minister, she is a prime minister of a G7 country, is almost hurting uh, central bank independence because she has a problem at home with growth and wants to blame the ECB with the constituents. Francine Lacqua there covering all that hawkish commentary for us at in Centra for the ECB Forum on Central Banking, from Centra to even the Dolce Vita in the Italian politics story, or lack thereof, <laughs> I should say. We're going to bring you coverage of that policy panel with Lagarde, Powell, and Ueda, as well as BOE's Andrew Bailey shortly. Plus, of course, Francine speaks to the Greek Central Bank governor just after 11.30 a.m. New York time. So, of course, we're going to keep an eye on that. From Centra, though, we go to Switzerland. More grim news in banking. UBS is planning to cut more than half of credit Suisse's workforce starting next month. Bearing the brunt will be bankers, traders, and other staff in London, New York, and parts of Asia. Joining us now is Bloomberg Swiss banking reporter Miriam Bellagio in Zurich. Another round of layoffs. When is this going to stop? Um, that's a good question. I think um, it's not going to stop in the next couple of months, that's for sure. Uh, we're expecting the first um, wave to hit in July. Um, followed by another wave in um, September and then later in the in the autumn. So, um, you know, bankers and, and staff at Credit Suisse should just brace themselves for, for more to come. Um, they, they had already been 10% of Credit Suisse's staff that had left since, um, you know, the term all started. So it's not um, new, but these new um, kind of waves of job cuts are not voluntary this time. What does this mean then for the top talent that UBS wants to retain, the top investment deal makers, the private wealth management? Does this kind of hurt their ability to hang on to them when they're letting go a lot of other folks? Well, that's um, that's a good point. It's um, it's been quite clear that um, UBS um, has done a big push to to retain key talent, especially in Asia. We've seen 
kind of um, retention packages uh, being offered to a lot of the um, private bankers there. And we know that wealth management is um, just paramount to, to UBS. So they've uh, put everything in place to, to retain best talent there. Um, as for the investment bank, uh, the investment bank is um, on the Credit Suisse side. That's um, going to be a bit, um, a bit harder for them. Um, UBS's executives have been very clear that um, there will be some significant cuts at UB, um, Credit Suisse's investment banks and the remaining bankers uh, will be put through a sort of a culture filter just to ensure that none of the kind of questionable uh, practices that were taking place as, uh, at Credit Suisse sort of um, transpire at the new UBS. Well, it's going to be interesting how essentially after all of this kind of restructuring is done, what UBS does end up looking like uh, in the fallout. Bloomberg's Miriam Bellagio in Zurich, we thank you as always for walking us through that crucial story. And we're going to complete our kind of tour around the world with the Asia and U.S. story, I'll argue. NVIDIA leading a decline in chip stocks on a report that Washington may tighten curbs on selling AI chips to China. Bloomberg Asia government and politics correspondent Rebecca Chung Wilkins joins us for more. Rebecca, it feels like this has been something we're talking about for a very long time. A lot of these chip companies already looking to diversify outside of China. What's new here? Well, essentially what we're seeing is the Biden administration sort of reportedly trying to close the loop when it comes to preventing uh, technologies that essentially aid Chinese movements to improve its AI technology. So there's two main components to this per that journal report. The first is that the US as early as this month may look to curb access of a sort of chips with lower capabilities and that's a problem for NVIDIA in particular because at the moment those chips just require um, a license from the Commerce Department um, and NVIDIA has focused on trying to produce more of that this year um, and the second component of these new restrictions would be limiting um, cloud services to Chinese AI companies now that potentially we don't have a lot of details but potentially it's quite a broad move there um, really potentially also tackling the issue of dual use technologies and which has long sort of plagued this issue for the Biden administration how do they actually limit uh, the development of technologies that are happening in China's private sector often for civilian use but then go into uh, so the military services so two sort of pronged approach there um, yet to really see my, many more details about it but of course the risk that many analysts have flagged is that China has been able to get around some of these curbs so far and unless we see really rigorous, effective implementation, in a way we are pushing China into creating more innovative ways of getting around these types of restrictions going forward in the longer term. Rebecca, we're also going to get earnings from Micron, the U.S. chip company, after the U.S. market closes today. Um, they're a company that has also been caught in the crosshairs. What's the latest with them in terms of the pressure they're feeling, of course, a, a different type of chip perhaps some of these bleeding uh, edge AI chips from NVIDIA. Absolutely. Well, if NVIDIA and AMD and so on are sort of being caught up in the Biden administration's move to curb, Micron has really been a victim of China's pushback to that. It's really the most prominent, the only major U.S. company that's found itself on the sort of tail end uh, of this type of criticism. So just to sort of remind, remind people, Micron failed uh, this probe that China's cyber security agency launched uh, last month uh, and as a result had to limit how much it was selling to Chinese clients and Micron have already warned that about half of its China headquartered clients will be affected by the results of, of the probe. So that represents about a low double digit percentage of its global revenue. Okay, Rebecca, thank you very much for that. That is Bloomberg's Rebecca Chung Wilkins. Coming up on the show with Critty and me, we're going to catch up with Anuj Ranjan Brookfield, president of Private Equity Next, and Josie Anderson, managing economist for the Center for Economics and Business Research, will also be joining us later this hour. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Kriti Gupta is in New York. 
Now, Brookfield Asset Management has been one of the world's most active deal makers this year, even as M&A has slowed down amid a dearth of financing. Just yesterday, Brookfield made a $4.3 billion bid for insurance firm American Equity. And already this year, it agreed to buy Middle Eastern payment processor Network International for $2.8 billion. And if that's not enough, it's also leading a consortium to buy Origin Energy for $12.5 billion. Pleased to say that joining Kriti and me now is Anuj Ranjin, president of uh, private equity at Brookfield. Anuj, you've been a busy man. <laughs> Thanks We've so much busy. for stopping by here. Um, look, you've, you've already done a lot. Are, are you still on the hunt for, for big transformative deals right now? Absolutely, and thank you for having me. I'd say as an industry as a whole, we're back to roll up your sleeves private equity. You can't really count on um, purely uh, available or cheap financing or revenue growth to deliver your returns. You have to uh, generate those returns and create that growth yourself through operational improvements. And that's something that we as Brookfield have been doing for forever, over the last 15 years. The private equity industry as a whole, its returns have come primarily from multiple expansion and revenue growth. For us, it's come from margin expansion. And so all of these examples you raise are examples of us being able to acquire businesses still and be active in this environment because we're really counting on our capability to run the businesses better. What happens to those who don't have the capacity to originate deals, to roll up their sleeves? What happens to those types of firms? So we are seeing um, the clients, our, our LPs, our institutional investors, our private wealth channels, uh, sovereign plans and pension plans, they are choosing fewer and fewer managers to manage their capital who have this capability. In a sense, you are seeing a consolidation in the industry. Um, not so much a consolidation through m and I mean, some of that might happen, but it's early days. But a consolidation in the sense that the clients are choosing and creating the winners. And um, we're thrilled to be on the right side of that. It's, it's a, you know, there's two worlds out there. The uh, people often talk about the um, denominator effect or less capital available in markets, that's true. But as the pie is getting smaller, fewer people or fewer firms are getting a bigger piece of that pie. And uh, for us, I mean, 2022 was our best fundraising year ever. Hmm. Um, and I think 2023 is looking no different. But if others in the industry are struggling to fundraise, could there be a liquidity issue? We saw a liquidity issue for VC. Yep. Um, we saw the ramifications of that with SVB, which hit the private equity industry too. Is private equity, again, maybe you're immune, but are other firms going to have a liquidity issue, not be able to put money into their companies to keep them going? I think uh, liquidity is um, scarce. It's available to those that have the capability and it's available in spades. But yes, as an overall industry, it's less available. I actually think it's a good thing. It creates a disciplined environment. You know, gone are the days of an auction with 45 bids, two preempts, and uh, I'd say, um, you know, some, some aggressive deal making. We're in a set place now where it's very, very rational, very reasonable, and uh, groups like ourselves can benefit, and uh, we're very excited about it. Right. Kriti, jump in here. Anuj, how do you think about that kind of roll up your sleeves approach when we're still talking about a recession in the works at some point? I feel like when you talk to some of your kind of private equity peers, a lot of the conversation has been comparing it to the global financial crisis and the fallout that the demand or the appetite for PE completely dried up. Do you see that happening if we do get some sort of recession on the books? So it's great. It's a great question. And, you know, um, I would say, it, look, it's a big world and there's a lot of different pockets of opportunity in different places. Um, we're a global firm. We're able to invest in the Middle East and India, where um, the network transaction, which Nani mentioned, for example, is, a, is, a mark, is in a market where there is still significant growth. Um, but at the same time, places closer to home, like here in Europe, you have uh, some more deep value opportunities to invest as well. I think it comes back to uh, prioritizing cash flow in the businesses that you buy. If you are uh, able to deliver that cash flow, either through... Um, buying businesses for value or creating those operational improvements, there's still going to be um, great returns to make in the sector. And I think the sector will be quite healthy. What about appetite in places like India or, or China at the moment, where perhaps there's a little bit of hesitancy, at least from a public markets perspective, to, to deploy some cash? How are you thinking about the geopolitics there? Yeah, so India, for example, we've, uh, we've been in India for um, over 15 years. Uh, we are probably the largest uh, foreign investor in the country. We've built a real capability, uh, over $25 billion of assets on the ground, 100 investment people. It's a market that we feel very comfortable investing because of the uh, capability that we've built, the boots on the ground that we have there. 
And uh, again, I, I take that market, I take the Middle East, but even if you take Europe or the US, which is our, our core market, um, we, we are investing in places we understand very well, where we've been for a long time, and where we know we can make great returns in a long term, uh, on a long term basis. And you're being modest. You literally built the business in India. <laughs> you say we. I mean, you, you really led that effort. Um, look, in, in this macro environment, which, which Kriti was talking to, that's difficult. Are you seeing signs in any of your portfolio companies that would suggest we're on the path to recession? It, again, depends on the market, and mm -hmm. it depends on the environment. Um, parts of Asia, we see still quite a bit of growth uh, in the businesses we buy. Um, businesses we have tended to acquire have been a little bit more resilient. And because we prioritized businesses with significant cash flow generation capability, even in the past, we're not seeing quite the impact today. If you own mission critical large businesses that can pass on the effects of inflation, um, you know, you're, you're in a pretty good shape today as you were in the past. I think in certain types of investing where cash flow wasn't the priority, this environment's going to be a lot tougher. To kind of bring it around where, where we started, Anuj, if, if you are kind of working harder to originate these deals, what, what is next for you? Are we going to see a lot more deals this year from Brookfield that are multi, multi-billion dollar deals? Is that in the pipeline? It could be. Um, this environment has been uh, very exciting. Uh, we're excited about buying businesses that have, I'd say, infrastructure-like characteristics. And, you know, if you know us, you know us as a group that is invested in uh, the backbone of the global economy. That's often the physical backbone. It includes renewable power generation, data centers, uh, ports, railways, industrial warehousing, and malls. But it also includes what I'll say is the financial backbone of the global economy, where digitalization is having huge impact, creating tremendous needs for capital, and things like payments businesses, businesses that have infrastructure-like characteristics, but a tremendous amount of growth potential as well, unlimited capacity. Those are very exciting in an environment like today. But again, we're we're busy across the board and, uh, and uh, we're investing um, generally in most of our markets and across all of our sectors. How are you thinking about interest rate hedging right now when you're buying these companies and setting them up for what might be a few more hikes from the ECB and Fed? Well, that's a great question. You know, it's funny, um, we're seeing in the credit markets, again, just like we see a flight to quality generally in the industry on the equity side, we're also seeing a flight to quality on the credit side. And uh, I'd say strong sponsors with strong balance sheets who have uh, businesses that have generate strong cash flow are still seeing credit availability at, uh, at very attractive terms. I mean, just, just very recently, we own a business called Clarios, which is the world's largest uh, automotive battery manufacturer. And uh, that business was able to upsize its senior debt from one and a half to three and a half billion dollars at effectively the same terms. And that was available to us even in this environment. So, you know, I think it comes back to the type of business and the type of owner that really dictates um, what credit markets will do. As a result of that, we're quite comfortable today that we can, uh, the interest rate exposure we have is, is it's properly hedged, but also our businesses can, uh, can properly absorb the interest rate hikes. Is there a level though where that becomes untenable? Because, uh, you know, for a lot of the industry, it's okay, we have a few more hikes, it's done, maybe we start cutting. If we're higher for longer, for example, is, is that an issue or are, are you comfortable if it is higher you know, for longer? I think we're in a place where, I would say it differently, the past 15 years or 10 years of free money was probably not normal. Um, we may be going a little bit further than what a comfortable normal position would be, but I think we're in a normal place. You know, debt should not be free. Mm. Um, people should buy businesses that can withstand a normal cost of capital. Right. Oh, I love normalcy. That's great. That's <laughs> great to hear, Anuj. Thank you so much for joining t this morning. We really appreciate your time. That is Brookfield's Anuj Ranjan. Now, coming up, we're going to be speaking to Josie Anderson, Managing Economist at the Center for Economics and Business Research, next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Investors await news from the world's top central bankers. We're live in central Portugal as Lagarde, Powell, Ueda and Bailey get ready to take center stage. And another dramatic shakeout. UBS is planning to cut more than half of Credit Suisse's workforce starting next month as a result of the bank's emergency takeover. 
and chip makers, including NVIDIA and AMD, retreat on a report the Biden administration is considering new curbs on AI exports to China. I'm Krita Gupta in New York with Danny Berger in London. Look, Danny, I know we're looking a lot at the central banking story today, given uh, a lot of the main players speaking at Centra. But I got to say, the geopolitics creeping back in there as we talk about that tech read through. You know, the remarkable thing is, is, okay, U.S. tech, NVIDIA, AMD, like you mentioned, getting hit hard. But tech is actually the best performing sector in Europe right now. Maybe just the assumption is, okay, this is a very U.S. specific story. This is closing loopholes when it comes to AI chips in America. So maybe the ASMLs of the world, the just Europe chip makers, maybe they'll come out of this okay. And we are seeing yields come down. So why not buy tech right now? So European equities snapping their six-day losing streak to right now being up about half a percent. Little action in the euro despite some of the hawkish readings we've gotten out from Sintra. People familiar telling Bloomberg that some ECB policy members are looking at unwinding the balance sheet sheet more quickly doesn't necessarily mean that's going to happen. Maybe that's just a bargaining chip. Meanwhile, we had Italian inflation coming in more than expected, 6.7% instead of 6.8%. A rally in European bonds has ensued. And we continue to see flattening in the UK yield curve uh, now at a multi-decade low, negative 95 basis points that spread between the two and 10-year gilt yields. Critty. Yeah, Danny, I would say that green on the screen you're seeing, at least in the equity market in Europe, not translating to the U.S., but I think you make a really fair point that there is this trade-off here between kind of the U.S. chip story and the European chip story. Remember, as we started to have the Biden administration create a lot of these incentives for American chip companies, Europe kind of came in and said, well, not only are we going to match them, we're going to supersede them. So there is kind of that incentive there from Europe to say, well, this is a U.S.-China story, hands off. Nevertheless, it is weighing on uh, the markets this morning. NASDAQ features down about six-tenths of one percent, underperforming the broader market. I wonder if that kind of continues into the opening bells, given that NVIDIA uh, is such a heavyweight. So something to keep in mind. But at the same time, the bond market is catching a bit here, which is interesting, given how much kind of expectation there is around that hawkish rhetoric, specifically coming out of central Portugal. The two-year yield, 472, already moving about three basis points lower early in the session. What's interesting is that this does feel like a little bit of a geopolitical bid, as opposed to kind of a monetary policy-driven bid. That's going to be something we're diving into, especially given uh, the move you just pointed out in gilts as well. As yields come down, though, the dollar actually strengthens, and a lot of that has to do with the commodity story, simply because NYMEX crude, although in the last 30 minutes has completely turned around, was weighing on commodity currencies earlier, which was giving a little bit of a tailwind to the Bloomberg dollar index. NYMEX crude right now, trading at a 68 handle, up by about 1%. 30 minutes, Danny, makes all the difference. All right, let's dive more into the European economic picture, Critty, because as I mentioned, we had Italian inflation uh, for the past month come in lower than expected, 6.7%. The estimate was for 7.8%. Now, if the direction holds, it does appear that Eurozone inflation is starting to ease. You can see across the countries, Italy, France, Eurozone as a whole, Germany, Spain, that trend does seem to be in. So what do you do if you are an ECB policymaker now Joining us is Josie Anderson, Managing Economist at the Center for Economics and Business Research. Um, Josie, can ECB policymakers, okay, they want to hike one more time, but can that be it if this is the trend? Do they risk overdoing it if they go beyond July? Yeah, it's an interesting picture. So it seems pretty certain that we're going to get a July hike. But yeah, I guess the question is, will we get more hikes after that? And actually, the inflation story in the Eurozone is fairly positive at the moment. You know, we're getting data for the Eurozone as a whole on Friday, and we're expecting that to come in at around 5.6%, down from 6.1% in May. Um, and actually, the, the really good thing about the Eurozone is core inflation appears to be coming down, because that's more of a concern in the UK, for instance, where core inflation seems to be flatlining, and there are concerns about it even coming up due to kind of broader base service inflation, whereas in the Eurozone, it seems to be coming down, and, and that could allow um, for the ECB to ease off um, in terms of further rate hikes. That being said, the ECB has, for the last couple of years, been behind the Bank of England and the Fed in terms of hiking rates. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see another one, for instance, in September, um, because even if you know inflation comes down to, to 4% or, or lower in the coming months, the target is still 2%. Um, and actually, I think even the broader econo economic story in the Eurozone um, is improving. So we saw the latest data revise um, for a recession at the end of last year and, and Q1 this year. But actually, I think looking ahead with inflation coming down, um, you know, allowing for any events that could happen in Russia and Ukraine, um, actually, I think the situation is possibly improving, which could allow for another mm. rate hike. 
What about unwinding the balance sheet more quickly? There's a Bloomberg scoop today that that's in discussion with some ECB policymakers. Again, I know that they often use this just as the Hawks will use it as a bargaining chip sometimes. Um, but is that necessary? Should they be rolling off the balance sheet more quickly at this point? Yeah, it's certainly an, an option, you know, as an alternative um, to rates, it, it's using that lever in the markets. Um, so it's obviously something they'll be considering, you know, every every time they meet um, as an option. And, and that certainly, you know, is another is another way of easing. Um, mm. So so it wouldn't surprise me if we see more news on that in the coming months, um, whether or not we see that in July. I think, it, it, you know, it wouldn't be surprised me if we don't. OK. Josie, what does it take to turn that around? At what point do we start to see the Hawks around the world, not just at the ECB, really change their tune? What, what kind of move do we have to see in the data? Yeah, interesting. So, I mean, so in the UK, for instance, I think obviously the latest news has all been fairly worrying about inflation. Um, so, you know, it, the latest data not showing a move down, in inflation surprising at a higher rate, um, has concerned monetary policymakers. And we obviously saw this big 50 basis point surprise. Um, and I think we're probably going to see at least two more rate hikes. Um, you know, I think markets possibly expect um, rates to go above 6%, which we're not, um, we're not expecting. Um, I think in particular in the UK, actually, we have um, interesting energy markets with the off-gem energy price cap. And actually, we were expecting inflation to stay fairly high in the latest data, but July will be key um, for inflation um, to come down. And we are expecting inflation to ease um, below 5% by the end of the year, um, which could mean that the Bank of England can ease off in terms of, um, in terms of rate hikes. And so we're not actually expecting rates to go as high as perhaps market expectations predict. Um, I think in particular, yeah, once we get that, that energy prices effect coming yeah. through, which has come through faster in other countries, um, yeah, then the, the Bank of England might be able to ease off um, and, and we'll see fewer rate hikes going forward. Right. Well, Josie, speaking of that kind of energy rate through, let's bring it to the United States here. To what extent is the commodity pressures that you're seeing in Europe, and I would argue kind of the wage pressures as well, turning into a more European story, given that even in the last 24 hours or so, we've got a kind of deluge of positive data on the U.S. economic front. Are you starting to see some sort of divergence between the fates of the U.S. and Europe? Yeah, it's interesting because in U.S. inflation has come down a fair amount now, you know, to, to 4% in May, um, down from that peak of 9.1%. Um, and so I think that there is room. Obviously, we saw the, the pause in rate hikes in the latest meeting. It wouldn't surprise me if we see one or even two more rate hikes actually later in the year. But then I think they'll certainly stop because I think inflation has come down quite well in the U.S. Um, but there does remain that concern about core inflation because most of the easing so far has come from more volatile volatile elements, you know, energy prices have come down across the world and that has brought down inflation. Um, but if there still is an element of core inflation uh, which persists, um, that could, um, you know, that could mean that inflation is higher above that kind of 2% target for longer and that would mean that more action is needed. And, and, and as Kriti mentioned, the data has been remarkable over the past 24 hours. It's been an improvement in housing, sales, prices also, consumer confidence. Um, durable goods orders. Is this recession delayed or denied? I think we were um, we were always quite positive about the U.S. economy. I think um, you know I think the reason as to why there might be a recession is obviously because rates have become so high, and that makes the trading environment much more difficult for businesses. You know, if they need to borrow to invest, um, then it's much more expensive, and that does create a more difficult environment. And we haven't fully, I think, seen the effects of these higher rates come through in the data actually yet. Um, you know, that being said, we've got so much positive data and also on the labour market, you know, it's persistently tight. People have jobs. Um, they can find jobs if they need them for the most part. Um, and so they have an income. They can continue spending. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we still haven't seen the full effect, I think, of these high interest rates. And I think that will have a dampening effect on US GDP. But, yet we're still expecting a 1% rise in 2023. Um, you know, we're certainly not expecting a contraction for the year as a whole. But I think, you know, it's possible that we'll see two quarters of contraction, I think, in the second half of the year. Um, but also, I think the big picture is kind of very weak growth. It could be weakly positive or weakly negative. But I think, you know, developed countries as a whole, 2023 has not been great for growth. But whether or not we see a recession, um, you know, it's teetering on the edge. 
Josie, I love that Danny said delayed or denied. I'll throw another option in there. What about even detected? When we're talking about whether or not we can foresee a recession, traditionally, you kind of have to look in hindsight to say, oh, yeah, that's what that was. Talk to us about visibility when it comes to kind of forecasting some of this economic data, just given the massive swings we've had on both sides of the Atlantic in, in both directions. Yeah, it's true. And I think a recent example of this is, of course, the fact that um, the recent Eurozone recession in Q4 and Q1 um, was only detected in the revised data, not in the initial estimates. And I think that is just because, um, as a whole, across most of the countries we've been talking about, um, GDP has kind of been flatlining. So whether or not it's a 0.1% rise or a 0.1% decline that takes us into a technical recession, um, it, it's really hard to detect, you know, obviously in a forecast, but then even in the initial estimate of the data, and then we get second and third estimates, and they tell us even more information. Um, but I think, you know, if we zoom out and look at the big picture, um, you know, these economies aren't doing really well. We're not seeing high rates of GDP growth. We're seeing flatlining economies essentially. Um, and that's, I think, in large part to do, to do with, you know, high inflation, and high interest rates um, and the cost of living crisis that's going on across the Eurozone, um, US and UK. All right, Josie, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks so much for joining this morning. That's Josie Anderson of the Center for Economics and Business Research. Now, coming up, the Fed is scheduled to release its bank stress test results later today. I'll have a preview for, for you on that next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Danny Berger in London. We're getting to some banking news here. Jefferies getting hit by the deal-making slowdown. The firm's fiscal second quarter revenue from investment banking plunged 26%. For more on this and other Wall Street stories, we're joined by our resident Wall Street correspondent, Shanali Basik. Talk to us about the Jefferies story first. 26% drop in deal-making. How does that compare to some of its peers? Yeah, on one hand, you look at the drop in deal-making and it feels concerning because it's been a prolonged kind of downturn in deal-making. However, remember, when we look at the quarter, it's very backward looking. There was a lot of extraordinary events, including bank failures during that period. And so, of course, you would expect deals to be muted in that time. I would point out to kind of temper this, when you look at Jeffrey's shares, they haven't declined as much as a lot of the financial system has. And so you see large investment banks still holding up better than you see a lot of the consumer banks. I would also say they did beat on trading estimates. The reason we follow Jeffrey so closely in part is because when you look, if they kind of report earlier than the rest of Wall Street. A couple weeks from now, we'll hear from the other big banks. And this idea that trading has held up is surprising to some because you're looking at other banks already warning that trading will be under pressure. So it will be very choppy results across the banks when it comes to the trading businesses. And you're going to be looking at these banks really trying to eke out as much profit as they can from those businesses in particular. Shanali, we, we were just speaking with the um, head of Brookfield Private Equity about some of the big ticket deals they've done. I know you've been covering the, this topic too. Is there any sign that deal making is starting to come back and maybe after this quarter finally investment banking won't be such a thorn in the side of these big lenders? It's such an interesting question because when you look at the, the deals that are happening, they're not necessarily traditional private equity. Things like Brookfield, they had kind of a corporate deal here where they brought in an insurance company. But yes, to the point that you're making here is there are some deals coming back, but they're not large, large, large deals. They're kind of sub $5 billion deals. When you look at it also, when it comes to the really big deals, the buy Biden administration's tone has been very, very stark when it comes to the prospect for deal making. There's a lot of concern about antitrust, both coming from the FTC and the Department of Justice. So there's a sense that deal making is eking back, but they're not this wave of private equity deals yet. And they're not necessarily very, very large deals as well, because people are very afraid of the uncertainty still when it comes to regulation, even more than the markets. Well, speaking of that regulation, we are getting those stress tests uh, across Wall Street today as well. It feels like we're paying extra attention after the banking turmoil than we traditionally have. What can we expect to hear from those? Yeah, the interesting thing here is there's an expectation of higher capital requirements anyways. I mean, you look at Barclays and Wall Street estimates really just largely here about the capital return plans for the banks. 
we watch the stress tests, but we also watch the capital return plans on the heels of these stress tests. The expectation is that across the biggest banks that it's going to be reduced by about 8% gritty. And you see the biggest reduction at the big investment banks, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, for example. There's also a big concern here that it's not just the biggest U.S. banks that are going to be facing tighter capital rules. There's an expectation and concern here that the mid-sized banks here will not only face, uh, you know, kind of a broader array of banks facing these stress tests in the future, but the regional banks here will be very capital constrained moving forward. So a lot of uh, reading the tea leaves coming out of this set of stress tests when we watch how these banks fare, particularly those mid-sized banks where people are very concerned about the capacity to lend into the cycle. We, we did see some, some criticism um, from the FDIC during some of these congressional hearings that the stress tests didn't capture the stress of higher interest rates and what that meant on some of these banking balance sheets. Um, in terms of this stress test, are there going to be any differences this time around from previous ones, or are they likely to ever include anything like that? Yeah, that's that was a big criticism, right, because they don't often test a, a rise in interest rates. And par, a part of that is because in a stress scenario, the Fed tends to reduce interest rates in the face of very tight economic conditions. So uh, yes, I mean, the question is, how do you test this better in the future? And how do bank supervisors, more than the stress test, capture some of these issues? There are differences this year with some of the scenarios when it comes to certain parts of real estate and when it comes to GDP being uh, in a more dire strait than in prior years. I would say when you think about it, there's a really wide range of banks tested here. And uh, in, in kind of a downturn that severe, We've already seen a lot of loan losses tick up. It will be really interesting to see how some of these other firms fare with their lending books in such a severe scenario. But to the point you're making, when you look at tougher stress tests moving forward, Danny, there's a lot of concern among lawmakers when it comes to the regulators saying, hey, listen, like you missed all of these things already. Why are you making the tests even tougher when there are certain things you're already missing when it comes to the banking system? All right, a final kind of story on Wall Street that Danny and that really caught Danny uh, in my eye was a $120 per hour pay rate for some of the interns on Wall Street, Citadel, offering that. And Danny and I were like, where was this when we were we were graduating <laughs> uh, school? That being said, put this into some context for us. I think Citadel came out and said, we don't actually shell those out very often. Yeah, I mean, listen, Citadel, and we all know this, kind of in the totem pole of Wall Street here, getting a hedge fund job as an intern is a pretty rare thing. But with that said, you know, and we were kind of talking about this with a lot of the private equity firms, and they were like, we are not paying $120 an hour. <laughs> but <laughs> when it comes down to it, at the end of the day, uh, people like having interns around. Remember, Citadel, for example, started in college for Ken Griffin, uh, or he started his trading career that way. So there's an expectation here that a lot of people who were previously going into technology can now be recruited, for example, into finance, and you see it in the applications ticking up so meaningfully. Surge in applications at Citadel. Some of these yeah. firms are getting 70,000 applications for a couple hundred jobs. Yeah. And so uh, the banks are certainly not paying that much, maybe less than $50 an hour in most cases. Yeah. So definitely an outlier, but yes, the interns are getting paid this summer. Yeah, I'm certainly not helpful uh, in terms of the competitive landscape when you are graduating college and looking for that Wall Street job. Shelly Bassick, thank you, as always looking at really everything going on, on on Global Wall Street. Let's go ahead to what we're going to see next week. That's going to come up next on the show, the daily brief, some of the market moving events that you need to know on the macro and the micro front. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Kriti Gupta is in New York. Let's take a look now at what's ahead on the docket today. We're going to start with some U.S. data. Wholesale inventories are coming out at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Then it is the big one, the main event in Sintra. It's a panel discussion with President Lagarde, Chair Powell, Governor Ueda, and Governor Bailey at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Again, that is at that ECB forum in Portugal. Plus, the Fed will release the results of its bank stress test at 4.30 p.m. We're just talking to Shanali Basic about that. And finally, Micron's earnings come out after the U.S. market closed. A day, Critty, after we saw some tech stocks really sell off in the post-market with uh, the U.S. trying to crack down on some loopholes when it comes 
on, to selling chips to China. Yeah, one of the bull cases essentially for a lot of these chip makers are the idea that AI is going to be something that a lot of companies are investing uh, kind of full steam ahead. But the bear case, to your point, Danny, is that China story. And that's exactly what's weighing on a lot of these chip makers this morning. NVIDIA really leading the pack down about 4.4%, taking the others down with it. I think what's important for the opening bells here is that because NVIDIA is such a heavyweight, you could see that uh, kind of seep into the uh, full op uh, full trading session, excuse me. And you're already kind of seeing a little bit of that NASDAQ futures, for example, underperforming the broader market. So something you want to keep an eye on in terms of how much of that is reversed or perhaps accelerated throughout the rest of the trading day. Another major tech story that's catching my eye though, Danny, and it's a story I'm kind of obsessed with, um, is this Microsoft Activision deal, a $70 billion deal on the table. What would bring Microsoft into a fairly nascent space of cloud gaming? Well, the FTC is trying to take them to court, trying to delay the deal a closing date of July 18th. So they are really playing with time here in the last 24 hours or so. We did get testimony from the FTC side, from uh, the Sony side, which is essentially the maker of PlayStation, com uh, competing directly with Xbox as well. And it's pretty fascinating. In this testimony here, we got the idea that if Microsoft does go ahead with this deal, it's not just about the gaming, they could be taking over somewhere between five to 8% of the console market where PlayStation mm -hmm. is already the leader. So there's a lot to digest there, Danny. Yeah, look, where I sit here in the UK, we've already had some of the regulators block that deal. They already don't want this deal to go through. And this is interesting because it's kind of, can regulation keep up with tech? The issue is the cloud. Could Microsoft potentially block Call of Duty, for example, from people playing it on a PlayStation, downloading it from the cloud? Sony yesterday, you mentioned this, Kriti, that they testified the head of Sony Interactive Entertainment said, I believe this transaction is bad for competition and they might use Call of Duty, for example, to somehow damage us. But you might expect him to say something like that. All right, that's it for early edition. Surveillance is ahead on Bloomberg.